is the fourth story, The Prince and the Princess. The next time that Gerda was forced to rest, a big crow came hopping across the snow in front of her. For a long time he'd been watching her and cocking his head to one side, and now he said, Caw! Caw! Good caw day! He could not say it any better, but he felt kindly inclined toward the little girl and asked her where she was going in this great wide world, all alone. Gerda understood him when he said alone, and she knew its meaning all too well. She told the crow the whole story of her life and asked if he hadn't seen Kay. The crow gravely nodded his head and cawed, Maybe I have, maybe I have. What do you really think you have? The little girl cried, and almost hugged the crow to death as she kissed him. Gently, gently, said the crow. I think it may have been little Kay that I saw, but if it was, then he has forgotten you for the princess. Does he live with the princess? Gerda asked. Yes, listen, said the crow. But it's so hard for me to speak your language. If you understand crow talk, I can tell you much more easily. I don't know that language, said Gerda. My grandmother knows it just as well as she knows baby talk, and I do wish I had learned it. No matter, said the crow. I'll tell you as well as I can, though that won't be any too good. And he told her all that he knew. In the kingdom where we are now, there is a princess who is uncommonly clever, and no wonder. She has read all the newspapers in the world and forgotten them again. That's how clever she is. Well, not so long ago she was sitting on her throne, and that's by no means as much fun as people suppose, so she fell to humming an old tune, and the refrain of it happened to run, Why, oh why, shouldn't I get married? Why, that's an idea, said she, and she made up her mind to marry as soon as she could find the sort of husband who could give a good answer when anyone spoke to him, instead of one of those fellows who merely stand around looking impressive, for that's so tiresome. She had the drums drubbed to call together all her ladies in waiting, and when they heard what she had in mind, they were delighted. Oh, we like that, they said. We were just thinking the very same thing. Believe me, said the crow, every word I tell you is true. I have a tame lady love who has the run of the palace, and I heard the whole story straight from her. Of course, his lady love was also a crow, for birds of a feather will flock together. The newspapers immediately came out with a border of hearts and the initials of the princess, and you could read an announcement that any presentable young man might go to the palace and talk with her. The one who spoke best, and who seemed most at home in the palace, would be chosen by the princess as her husband. Yes, yes, said the crow. Believe me, that's as true as it is that here I sit. Men flocked to the palace, and there was much crowding and crushing, but on neither the first nor the second day was anyone chosen. Out in the street they were all glib talkers, but after they entered the palace gate, where the guardsmen were stationed in their silver braided uniforms, and after they climbed up the staircase, lined with footmen in gold embroidered livery, they arrived in the brilliantly coloured reception halls, without a word to say. And when they stood in front of the princess on her throne, the best they could do was to echo the last word of her remarks, and she didn't care to hear it repeated. It was as if everyone in the throne room had his stomach filled with snuff and had fallen asleep, for as soon as they were back in the streets, there was no stopping their talk. The line of candidates extended all the way from the town gates to the palace. I saw them myself, said the crow. They got hungry and they got thirsty, but from the palace they got nothing, not even a glass of lukewarm water. To be sure, some of the clever candidates had brought sandwiches with them, but they did not share them with their neighbours. Each man thought, just let him look hungry, then the princess won't take him. But Kay, little Kay, Gerd interrupted. When did he come? Was he among those people? Give me time, give me time, we're coming to him. On the third day, a little person with neither horse nor carriage strolled boldly up to the palace. His eyes sparkled the way yours do, and he had handsome long hair, but his clothes were poor. Oh, that was Kay, Gerda said, and clapped her hands in glee. Now I've found him. He had a little knapsack on his back, the crow told her. No, that must have been his sled, said Gerda. He was carrying it when he went away. Maybe so, the crow said. I didn't look at it carefully. But my tame lady love told me that when he went through the palace gates and saw the guardsman in silver, and on the staircase the footman in gold, he wasn't at all taken aback. He nodded, and he said to them, 
It must be very tiresome to stand on the stairs. I'd rather go inside. The halls were brilliantly lighted. Ministers of state and privy councillors were walking about barefooted, carrying golden trays in front of them. It was enough to make anyone feel solemn, and his boots creaked dreadfully, but he wasn't a bit afraid. That certainly must have been Kay, said Gerda. I know he was wearing new boots. I heard them creaking in Grandmother's room. Oh, they creaked all right, said the crow, but it was little enough he cared, as he walked straight to the princess, who was sitting on a pearl as big as a spinning wheel. All the ladies-in-waiting with their attendants, and their attendants' attendants, and all the lords-in-waiting with their gentlemen and their gentlemen's men, each of whom had his page with him, were standing there, and the nearer they stood to the door, the more arrogant they looked. The gentlemen's men's pages, who always wore slipper, were almost too arrogant to look, as they stood at the threshold. Well, that must have been terrible, little Gerda explained. And yet Kay won the princess? If I weren't a crow, I would have married her myself, for all that I'm engaged to another. They say he spoke as well as I do when I speak my crow language, or so my tame lady love tells me. He was dashing and handsome, and he was not there to court the princess, but to hear her wisdom. This he liked, and she liked him. Of course it was Kay, said Gerda. He was so clever that he could do mental arithmetic, even with fractions. Oh, please take me to the palace. That's easy enough to say, said the crow. But how can we manage it? I'll talk it over with my tame lady love. She may be able to suggest something, but I must warn you that a girl like you will never be admitted. Oh, yes I shall, said Gerda. When Kay hears about me, he will come out to fetch me at once. Wait for me beside that stile, the crow said. He wagged his head, and off he flew. Darkness had set in when he got back. Caw, caw, he said. My lady love sends you her best wishes, and here's a little loaf of bread for you. She found it in the kitchen, where they have all the bread they need, and you must be hungry. You simply can't get into the palace with those bare feet. The guardsman in silver and the footman in gold would never permit it. But don't you cry, we'll find a way. My lady love knows of a little back staircase that leads up to the bedroom, and she knows where they keep the key to it. Then they went into the garden and down the wide promenade, where the leaves were falling one by one. When, one by one, the lights went out in the palace, the crow led little Gerda to the back door, which stood ajar. Oh, how her heart did beat with fear and longing! It was just as if she were about to do something wrong, yet she only wanted to make sure that this really was little Kay. Yes, truly, it must be Kay, she thought, as she recalled his sparkling eyes and his long hair. She remembered exactly how he looked when he used to smile at her as they sat under the roses at home. Wouldn't he be glad to see her? Wouldn't he be interested in hearing how far she had come to find him and how sad they had all been when he didn't come home? She was so frightened, and yet so happy. Now they were on the stairway. A little lamp was burning on a cupboard, and there stood the tame crow, cocking her head to look at Gerda, who made the curtsy that her grandmother had taught her. My fiancé has told me many charming things about you, my dear young lady, she said. Your biography, as one might say, is very touching. Kindly take the lamp, and I shall lead the way. We shall keep straight ahead, where we aren't apt to run into anyone. It seems to me that someone is on the stairs behind us, Gerda said. Things brushed past, and from the shadow on the wall they seemed to be horses with spindly legs and waving manes and there were shadows of huntsmen, ladies and gentlemen, on horseback. Those are only dreams, said the crow. They come to take the thoughts of their royal masters off to the chase. And that's just as well, for it will give you a good opportunity to see them while they sleep. But I trust that when you rise to high position and power, you will show a graceful heart. Tut, tut, you've no need to say that, said the forest crow. Now they entered the first room. It was hung with rose-coloured satin, embroidered with flowers. The dream shadows were flitting by so fast that Gerda could not see the lords and ladies. That Gerda could not see the lords and ladies. Hall after magnificent hall quite bewildered her, until at last they reached the royal bedroom. The ceiling of it was like the top of a huge palm tree, with leaves of glass, costly glass. In the middle of the room, two beds hung from a massive stem of gold. Each of them looked like a lily. One bed was white, and there lay the princess. The other was red, and there Gerda hoped to find little Kay. 
She bent one of the scarlet petals and saw the nape of a little brown neck. Surely this must be Kay. She called his name aloud and held the lamp near him. The dreams on horseback pranced into the room again as he awoke and turned his head. And it was not little Kay at all. The prince only resembled Kay about the neck, but he was young and handsome. The princess peeked out of her lily-white bed and asked what had happened. Little Gerda cried and told them all about herself and about all the crows had done for her. A poor thing, the prince and princess said. They praised the crows and said they weren't the least bit angry with them, but not to do it again. Furthermore, they should have a reward. Would you rather fly about without any responsibilities, said the princess, or would you care to be appointed court crows for life, with rights to all scraps from the kitchen? Both the crows bowed low and begged for permanent office, for they thought of their future and said it was better to provide for their old age, as they called it. The prince got up and let Gerda have his bed. It was the utmost he could do. She clasped her little hands and thought, how nice the people and the birds are. She closed her eyes, fell peacefully asleep, and all the dreams came flying back again. They looked like angels, and they drew a little sled on which Kay sat. He nodded to her, but this was only in a dream, so it all disappeared when she woke up. The next day she was dressed from her head to her heels in silk, and in velvet too. They asked her to stay at the palace and have a nice time there, but instead she begged them to let her have a little carriage, a little horse, and a pair of little boots, so that she could drive out into the wide world to find Kay. They gave her a pair of boots, and also a muff. They dressed her as nicely as could be, and when she was ready to go, there at the gate stood a brand new carriage of pure gold. On it the coat of arms of the prince and princess glistened like a star. The coachman, the footman, and the postilions, for postilions there were, all wore golden crowns. The prince and the princess themselves helped her into the carriage, and wished her godspeed. The forest crow, who was now a married man, accompanied her for the first three miles, and sat beside Gerda, for it upset him to ride backward. The other crow stood beside the gate and waved her wings. She did not accompany them, because she was suffering from a headache brought on by eating too much in her new position. Inside, the carriage was lined with sugared cookies, and the seats were filled with fruit and gingerbread. Fare you well, fare you well, called the prince and princess. Little Gerda cried, and the crow cried too, for the first few miles. Then the crow said goodbye, and that was the saddest leave-taking of all. He flew up into a tree, waved his big black wings as long as he could see the carriage, which flashed as brightly as the sun. And that concludes part four of The Snow Queen by the Grimm Brothers. I hope you're enjoying this story. I'm definitely enjoying it. Uh, join me next week for part five in video number four, uh, and we'll find out, does Gerda find Kay? What happens next? Um, thank you for watching, if you've enjoyed this. Um, leave a comment, like it, subscribe, and hit that little bell icon. You know, all the things people normally ask. Um, if you'd like to follow me around the internet, I have a link to my Patreon page and to my Goodreads page, uh, so you can keep up with what I'm reading there. And if, if you have any suggestions or recommendations, I'm happy to take them. I think I mentioned last week that there were a couple of uh, stories that have been recommended to me. Um, I'm definitely going to read one of them. The other one I'm going to look into because I'm not sure if it's out of copyright yet. Um, but it looks like it could be a good story, but it would be a long one. Uh, I'm rambling. I'm going to just say goodbye now. Uh, catch me next week for part five. <laughs> Bye.